بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So inshallah ta'ala we came to uh, another lesson or we've reached another lesson from the explanation of the beautiful names of Allah Azza wa Jal from this amazing book, Fiqh al Asma al Husna, by our Sheikh Abdul Razak ni Abdul Muhsin al Badr Hafidahumullah Ta'ala. And it seems like we keep missing Friday night reflections. Yani. I feel like I haven't done Friday night reflections for like months. Because subhanAllah, something keeps coming in the, in the time. Yani. But inshallah ta'ala, next week there is no scheduled uh, cancellation. We only cancel uh, because of other programs that Kalima is running. Yani. So sometimes if Kalima is running another program, we know that people like to come to this class. And uh, it's not nice to say to people you have to choose either go to this one or this one. So for that reason, uh, for that reason, do it like this. So we have two names from the beautiful names of Allah, the perfect names of Allah Azza wa Jal, to cover today, and they are Al Hafiz and Al Hafiz. Al Hafiz and Al Hafiz. And both of these two names obviously come from the Arabic word Hifz. Hifz. And we'll come to the meaning of what that means uh, as we go through the text and we explain it and comment on it, inshaAllah ta'ala. So as always, the Shaykh begins by talking about where these names can be found in the Qur'an. And he says, beginning with Surah Hud, ayah number 57, Inna Rabbi ala kulli shay'in hafiz. Indeed, my Lord is over everything, hafiz. And usually in the beginning, I don't translate it because we're going to, the whole point of the entire class is to translate what the word means. And Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Saba, ayah number 21, Wa Rabbuka ala kulli shay'in hafiz. And your Lord is over everything, hafiz. And Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Shura, Ayah number six. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهُ حَفِيظٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَمَا أَنْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِوَكِيلٍ Those who have taken besides Allah awliya. They have taken awliya. They have taken supporters and protectors and you know, people they claim to be beloved and they've taken them as objects of worship besides Allah. Allah is hafiz over them. And you are not responsible for what they do. And Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Yusuf, ayah number 64, فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ Allah is better as a hafiz. Allah is a better hafiz or Allah is better as a hafiz. This is now the word, the name Al-Hafil. وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ And he is the most merciful of those who show mercy. And Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Anbiya, ayah number 82, وَكُنَّا لَهُمْ حَافِظِينَ And we were حَافِظِينَ of them. We were حَافِظ for them. And Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Hijr, ayah number 9, Indeed, we sent down the remembrance. And indeed, we will be its hafiz. We will be its hafiz. So we had these two words. We had al-hafiz and al-hafiz. And they both come from al-hifz. Okay. So let's get into the meanings. So these two names indicate that Allah Azza wa Jal is to be described with as being or, or described with the attribute of hifz. And we know we're going to cover the detailed meaning. We know broadly that the word hifz 
means something along the lines of protection, taking care of, and you know th- that kind of that's the kind of of meaning that we uh, uh, that we're so, that we're speaking about, and that is one of the sifat of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. In his sifat al that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala protects, and there is more of a meaning than that, inshallah. And as we said, or as we've established, you know, probably early on in the clause that we spoke about that every one of Allah's names, these are not just empty vessels that don't have any meaning. These names have meanings, they have sifat, they have attributes and characteristics. And so every name of Allah Azza wa Jal is both unique and the same. How is it unique and how is it the same? It's the same in the sense that all of those names refer to the same entity. It's not like Al-Hafiz is one God and Al-Hafiz is another and Al-Ilah is another. They all refer to the same entity, the same God. But they are different in the sense that every one of those names has a unique meaning that is completely separate from the meaning of those other, those other names. So the Sheikh goes on to talk about the meaning of al hifz as it relates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says that there are broadly two types of hifz, two types of protection or preservation we can also say for the word hifz. We use it for memorization as well, don't we? We, we say like hifz of the Qur'an and tahfiz and it's all the same thing to preserve, to protect, to, you know, to keep it and when we say hifz of the Qur'an, what we mean is we are preserving the Qur'an in our hearts. So protecting and preserving, these are the kind of terms that we're talking about. And protecting and preserving as it relates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically covers two categories of things or two things. The first one that the Shaykh talks about is al hifz bi ilmihi jami'a al-makhluqat. And so... Uh, and the Sheikh says, وَفِي مُقَابِلِ ذَلِكَ nisyan." This is really interesting. So the first meaning of hifz as it relates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the opposite of forgetfulness. So hifz as in the opposite of forgetfulness. And that is the knowledge of Allah azza wa jal of Every single thing that can be known. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved the knowledge of everything. So he doesn't forget anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't forget anything. And so one of the meanings of Hafiz and Hafiz is the one who doesn't forget anything. He has you know, memorized is the wrong word because memorized is an action which indicates you didn't know it before. But Allah has preserved it in His knowledge. That is perhaps the best word that I can come up with it in English. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved with His knowledge everything that can be known. So nothing is ever absent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing is ever you know, nothing is ever forgotten or nothing is ever missing from the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said the opposite of this is an nisyan, forgetfulness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has negated from Himself forgetfulness. As Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Maryam, وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيَّا and your Lord is never forgetful. And your Lord is never forgetful. And what do we say is the qa'idah? What's the rule when it comes to the negative attributes of Allah mentioned in the Quran? لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم وما كان ربك نسيا وما ربك بظلام للعبيد All of these negative attributes, the rule is we affirm the negative for Allah and we affirm the perfect opposite. So we never ever just speak about Allah in the negative. We never say, Allah does not forget, full stop. No, when we say Allah does not forget, that means, إثبات 
Kamal al-Did. It means to affirm the perfect opposite. So we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't forget, therefore he has perfect preservation of his knowledge. His knowledge is perfectly preserved. Because he subhanahu wa ta'ala negated from himself forgetfulness. And this indicates the perfection of Allah's preservation of knowledge, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved every kind of knowledge. As Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Taha, قَالَ عِلْمُهَا عِنْدَ رَبِّي فِي كِتَابِ لَا يَضِلُّ رَبِّي وَلَا يَنْسَى In ayah number 52 in Surah Taha. Say the knowledge of this is with my Lord in a book. This is the question that Fir'aun asked to Musa. When Fir'aun said, قَالَ فَمَا بَالُ الْقُرُونِ الْأُولَى He said, what happened to the early generations then? And you okay, Musa, you know, and, and this is really, Fir'aun is not asking Musa because he really wants to know. He, this is from the point of just, you know, Al-Jidal, just making an argument with him. He says, who is your Lord then, Musa? Go on, tell me, who is your Lord? So Musa tells him about Allah. And at some point, Fir'aun says to him, قَالَ فَمَا بَالُ الْقُرُونِ الْأُولَى What happened to those early generations then? And uh, the answer, قَالَ عِلْمُهَا عِنْدَ رَبِّي فِي كتاب. La yadillu rabbi wa la yansa. The knowledge of all of this is with my Lord in a book. My, my Lord does not or is not misguided, nor does he forget. La yadil, yani he doesn't go astray. I think it's probably the better word than saying misguided here. My Lord does not go astray. He doesn't make errors. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't do the wrong thing. La yadillu rabbi. My Lord does not go astray. وَلَا يَنْسَى Nor does he forget. And as Allah Azza wa Jal said in Al-Mujadila, ayah number 6, أَحْصَاهُ اللَّهُ وَنَسُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has encompassed them in their knowledge and yet they have forgotten Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they have turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though Allah azza wa jal has encompassed everything and enumerated everything about them with the knowledge that he has azza wa jal so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one of the you know the examples of this preservation of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preserving the actions of his creation and preserving their statements and knowing their intentions and what is in the, their chest, what's in their hearts. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves the record of our actions. This is from the hifth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when you will come yawm al-qiyamah, none of your actions will be missing. مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا What is the matter that we have this book? Not a single minor thing nor a single major thing has been left out of it except that it is enumerated in complete detail. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He preserves your actions for you so that you can meet the consequences of those actions يوم القيامة. And can you imagine how, you know, how immense that is to preserve the actions of every one of his creation and to record and preserve the actions of every single one of his creation. If one of you were just to try to write down all the actions that you do yourself, you would not be able to even reach 25% of the actions you do. Even if you had a pen in your hand all day, the niyat, the niyat you have, the things that you say, you know, the times you forgot, the times that you remembered, the times you remembered Allah with your heart and the times your heart was thinking of something else, you would not be able to even record 25% of the actions that you do. Now imagine that every single creation, the angels, the human beings, the jinn, the animals, the insects, every single thing on this earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 
a perfect record of everything they have ever done, everything they have ever, you know, wherever they have ever moved, every noise they have ever made, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a record of it. And this is from the hifth of Allah azza wa jal, from the preservation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his knowledge. And that means that there is nothing which is absent from the knowledge of Allah and nothing which is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah Azza wa Jal wrote this or commanded this to be written in Al-Lawh Al-Mahfuz, in the preserved tablet. As Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Qamar, وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ فَعَلُوهُ فِي الزُّبُرِ وَكُلُّ صَغِيرٍ وَكَبِيرٍ مُسْتَطَرٍ Everything that they do is written in the script, in the scripture or in the, script, in the manuscript, yani, or in the, yani, in the Lawh Al-Mahfuz. And every small thing and every big thing is written down. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted the responsibility to the angels of writing down and preserving the actions of the servants. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, in kullu nafsin lamma alayha hafiz. In Surah Al Tariq, ayah number four, every single soul has a hafiz over it. And the meaning of hafiz here, at least from the point of view of what the Shaykh is making the point of, is the angel who preserves your actions. How does that angel preserve those actions? By the hifz of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has entrusted and empowered that angel to be able to record every single thing that you say and every single thing that you do. And Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Infitar, Ayah 10 to 12, وَإِنَّ عَلَيْكُمْ لَحَافِظِينَ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ And indeed, over you, there are guardians, hafizin. And the meaning of the hifth here is clear because Allah says kiraman katibin, honorable scribes. And therefore the meaning of hifth here is not the angels that protect you from the harms or protect you from you know, bad things or, or protect you from happening things that have not been decreed. Rather the angels that pre preserve your deeds. So the meaning of this, indeed, over you, there are preserving angels, angels who preserve your deeds. Honorable scribes, they know what it is that you do. How is it that they know that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has empowered them to be able to do so, subhanahu wa ta'ala. This meaning of hif, this meaning of hif, necessitates what we talked about last time which is al-ihata encompassing everything with his knowledge subhanahu wa ta'ala so we talked about last time the name of Allah Azza wa Jal al-muhit we talked about it at some point any last time or the time before al-muhit and we said al-muhit indicates ihata and that Allah has surrounded everything and one of the ways that Allah has surrounded everything is through his knowledge because Allah Azza wa Jal, because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserves our actions for us then this is you know they, this is it necessitates it's a must that Allah has encompassed every single thing with his knowledge subhanahu wa ta'ala whether it is apparent whether it's hidden whether it is something that is on the outside or something on the inside and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written this in Allah al-Mahfuz and in the suhuf, the scriptures which are in the hands of the angels and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the amount of it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you have done that is complete and what you have done that is deficient and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how much reward that you had for that and how much punishment that you will have for that and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will as a consequence of this hif of your deeds, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will 
give recompense for those deeds from his fadl and his adl. And this is, I think, it's a beautiful thing the way the Sheikh says here. And it's important because he says that Allah Azza wa Jal will, as a consequence of this hifd, as a consequence of this preservation of your deeds, Allah will give you recompense. That recompense may be reward, that recompense may be punishment. Okay, if it is reward, then this is al-fadl. This is a grace from Allah. Because we don't deserve any reward. We are in the first place slaves of Allah. And the slave is not deserving of reward. The slave doesn't get reward. You don't, you don't pay your slave. You don't, you don't deserve reward. You're a slave of Allah Azza wa Jal. If Allah Azza wa Jal gives you nothing, you didn't deserve anything anyway. And from another angle, everything that you did was, by the, was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The guidance was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah azza wa jal said in Surah Al-Hujurat, فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَةِ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ It's a grace from Allah and a blessing. You love iman, you love doing good deeds. This is a grace from Allah. This is not something that you, you know, that you're such a magnificent person that Allah Azza wa Jal gave it to you. This is something that Allah Azza wa Jal gave you more than you deserve. And that should make you feel immense gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he's given you the ability to remember him when so many people have been, had that ability removed from them. But what did the Shaykh say also? By his grace and by his justice. Okay, so the grace is the good reward that you get. That every single piece of reward that you get is from the grace of Allah. And it's not something you deserve. It's not a like, you know, you did some work and Allah should give you this in return. It's a grace from Allah. It's a blessing from Allah. And that's why, what do we say? Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim. Al-in'am, an'amta alayhim. Al-in'am is something that you do for someone above what they deserve. Beyond what they deserve. You don't say about a worker, an'amtu alayhi. I've, you know, bestowed my favor upon him. You know, I've given him a ni'mah. You call it a ratib. You know, it's a wage you get. Or you call it a, you know, mukafa'ah. You know, like some sort of, you, get, you do something and you take something. And it's like a transaction. But you don't call it a ni'mah. A ni'mah is something that you give which is beyond what the person deserves. And that's why whenever Allah Azza wa in the Qur'an talks about the reward and the paradise and the blessings and the good that we do, it's a ni'mah from Allah. It's something beyond what we deserve. It's a grace from Allah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that grace and with his punishment does not go outside of justice. Because someone may say if it's a grace, is it random? So if the good deeds from Allah are a grace, they're a favor from Allah, there's something on top of what you deserve. So is it just random, like you get it, you don't, you get it, you don't, you get it, you don't? No. Allah Azza wa Jal gives that grace with justice and wisdom. And so the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never exceeds the justice and wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jal. It never goes out of the justice and wisdom of Allah. So yes, all of us are deficient. Yes, all of us do not deserve. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows which of us have tried and failed and which of us have not even tried. And so those who have tried and perhaps they, they have fell short, they have fallen short, but they have tried and they have strived and they have made an effort, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the grace. Not because they deserve it, but because of the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wisdom of Allah azza wa jal and Allah fulfilling the promise that he made in the Quran that those people who strive in our way we will guide them to our paths likewise the punishment of Allah azza wa jal the punishment of Allah azza wa jal does not go outside of his justice and there is no unjust punishment it's not like Okay, you are punished, you are not. Firstly, if Allah wanted to punish everyone in the earth, He would be justified in doing so. 
as Allah Azza wa Jal told us in the Quran. If Allah were to take you to account for what you do, He would not leave. ما ترك على ظهرها من دابة. He would not leave even an animal on the earth. Because all of us wrong each other, all of us wrong ourselves. If Allah were to take you to account for every wrong that you did, He would not have left a single thing alive on the earth. So it's within Allah's right to punish everybody. But again, does Allah randomly assign punishment to him and not to him? La Allah. With justice and wisdom. With justice and wisdom. So that punishment reaches the people who really truly deserve it and truly have not strived for Allah and have not asked Allah and have not worked and have not yani, done their effort to correct themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them exactly yani, what is just and what is fair. And so it's important to remember that because it answers, and none of this is yani, in the book, I'm just yani, adding, but it answers a lot of questions people have about al hidayah wal-idlal, yani the issues of guidance and misguidance as it relates to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because a lot of people feel very confused about this. How is it that Allah guides? How is it that Allah misguides? Who does Allah guide? Who does Allah misguide? And the answer to this is a principle, which is a beautiful principle, and you can kind of learn it by heart. Inna Allah yahdi man yasha ni'matan minhu wa fadla wa yudillu man yasha hikmatan minhu wa adla. This principle is, yani it should be learned by heart. Inna Allah yahdi man yasha. Allah guides whoever He wants. Ni'matan minhu wa fadla as a blessing from Him and a grace. Yani everyone who Allah guides, He gave you a favor, He gave you extra, He gave you a bonus. Yani the guidance is not something that you deserve, but it's an extra, it's a favor and a bonus. Wa yudillu man yasha and He misguides whoever He wants. Hikmatan minhu wa adla as a wisdom from Him and out of His justice. So guidance is a favor and a blessing and misguidance is wisdom and justice. And if you remember those principles and you read the Quran with that principle in mind, it will answer 99% of the questions that you have about guidance and misguidance. And especially if you read the Quran with that principle in mind, you'll see many ayat that explain and, and, and bring this principle for you very clearly. Like we said, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبَلَنَا Those who strive for us, we will guide them to our ways. And you work hard and Allah Azza wa Jal will give you that blessing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not misguide a person who sincerely tries for the sake of Allah with all of their heart. But at the same time we recognize all of us are deficient. From the examples of this, وَلَوْ تَرَى وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذْ وُقِفُوا عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ قَالُوا أَلَيْسَ هَذَا بِالْحَقِّ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ وَرَبِّنَا قَالَ فَذُوقُ الْعَذَابِ uh, Or no, the other ayah I was thinking of. Uh, in Surah Al-An'am. وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذْ وُقِفُوا عَلَىٰ النَّارِ فَقَالُوا يَا لَيْتَنَا نُرَدْ وَلَا نُكَذِّبَ بِآيَاتِ رَبِّنَا وَنَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ if you could only see when they were put over the hellfire and they say, if only we could be returned to the earth, we will never disbelieve in Allah and we will be from the believers. We will never disbelieve in the ayat of Allah and we will be from the believers. Then Allah Azza wa said in the following ayah, وَلَوْ رُدُّوا لَعَادُوا لِمَا نُهُوا عَنْهُ وَإِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ And if we put them back on the earth, they would do the exact same thing they did again and indeed they are the liars. Now can you imagine that? That these people who end up in Jahannam, these people who end up in Jahannam, they end up in Jahannam begging Allah, give me one more chance. And Allah says, if I gave you that chance from the knowledge that Allah has, that if I, we gave it to you and we took you out of the hellfire today and we put you back on the earth, you would do the same disbelief that you did before. Doesn't that person deserve out of justice to be from the people of the hellfire? 
Is there anything unjust about that person being in Jahannam when they're not even sincere? Even about getting out of Jahannam, they're not sincere. They only want a way out of the problem and they have no desire within themselves to change. Even after they've been put into Jahannam. They just want to get out of Jahannam, but they have no desire to change the actions that they did that put them there in the first place. So is this person not deserving of being in Jahannam? There's no doubt about that. So it's really important that we focus upon those things, the ni'mah of Allah Azza wa Jal and the adal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal and the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this will help people to understand the issue of Allah Azza wa Jal's guidance and his misguidance in a way that inshallah ta'ala will not confuse uh, people or lead people to think badly of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is kind of an outcome of the hifth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if Allah has preserved all of your actions then by default the next step is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to recompense give recompense based on those actions so he is either going to reward or he's going to punish based on that preservation of those actions the second type of hifth The second type of hifth. The first type was the preservation of knowledge. The second type of hifth. أنه تعالى الحافظ للمخلوقات من سماء وأرض وما فيهما لتبقى مدة بقاء لتبقى مدة بقائها. That Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who preserves. All of his creation, whether they are in the heavens or the earth and whatever is between them, in order that they remain in their place for an appointed time. They remain in their place. For example, for us, we remain on the earth for the time that Allah Azza wa Jal has appointed. So, this is the preservation or the protection of us so that we can fulfill what Allah has decreed for us to fulfill. So from this, is that the heavens do not collapse upon the earth and people do not disappear into nowhere and nothing is extended or cut short and nothing falls upon anything else except that Allah, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects each for each thing what, it ha what has been decreed for it. And nothing of that is difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nor is anything able to escape that protection or override that protection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given for it and this is the meaning of the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal in Ayat al-Kursi وَلَا يَؤُودُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا the protection of the heavens and the earth is not difficult for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not hard for Allah Azza wa Jal to protect everything in the heavens and the earth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects the heavens from falling upon the earth. As Allah Azza wa said in Surah Al-Hajj, ayah number 65, وَيُمْسِكُ السَّمَاءَ أَن تَقَعَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ And Allah holds the heavens from falling upon the earth except with His permission. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَجَعَلْنَا السَّمَاءَ سَقَفًا مَحْفُوظًا وَهُمْ عَنْ آيَاتِهَا مُعْرِضُونَ In Surah Al-Anbiya, ayah number 32, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the heavens as a protected roof. A roof which is protected. It doesn't fall down upon the earth. And the earth doesn't disappear and melt off into the heavens. And each thing has been protected in its place for as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. And yet they turn away from the ayat. They turn away from the signs of Allah in that, 
the way that Allah preserves the heavens and the earth, they turn away from those signs. And Allah Azza wa Jalla said in Surah Fatir, Ayah number 41, Inna Allah yumsiku samawati wal ardi an tazula. Allah Azza wa Jal holds the heavens and the earth from disappearing or from falling apart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken responsibility for protecting the Qur'an. Because we said the second type of protection is the first one was the preservation of knowledge. The second one, the protection for everything to have its place and its time. Allah Azza wa Jal has protected his book. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. Surah Al-Hijr, ayah number 9. We have sent down the remembrance and we will be the ones to protect it. We will be the one to protect it. So Allah Azza wa Jal has protected this Qur'an so that it cannot be changed or manipulated and nothing can be exchanged for anything else and not even a single letter can be changed despite the huge number of passage of time uh, which has gone uh, since the Qur'an was revealed and yet the Qur'an remains exactly as it is and the ayat remain exactly as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them down upon his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it will remain protected by the protection of Allah azza wa jal until that time, that very specific time comes that Allah azza wa jal has decreed. And we come to this in the topic of uh, yeah, in the signs of the last day, inshallah ta'ala. And when the Qur'an is removed from, uh, yeah, from the earth. And within this type of protection, or within this category of protection, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us from what we fear and what we dislike. And this is of two types. Again, and we've come across this many times in the names of Allah azza wa jal. Specific protection and general or general protection and specific protection. We come many times we said this. Like we said general mercy and specific mercy and we've you know many many things we've come across where we've said that there is a gen general meaning and there is a specific meaning or there is a general sort of protection and a specific protection. As for the general protection, Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected our food our drink, our atmosphere. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected these things for us, preserved them for us. So He has not made it that all of our food has become and He corrupted that we can't eat or all of our water has become poisoned so we can't drink it and our, you know that our air has become toxic and we can't breathe. Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preserved for us food that we can eat and water that we can drink and air that we can breathe and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us to what is in our interests and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us to what he has decreed and what he has legislated for us from the things that are necessary for us and the things that we need in order to live and in order to survive and this is from Al-Hidayatul Amma, which we talked about before, general guidance, which Allah Azza wa Jal has given to every one of his creation, from the human beings, Muslim and Kafir, from the animals, the insects, the birds, every single one of those creation, Allah Azza wa Jal has preserved for them their food, their drink, their environment so that they can yani they can breathe or they can function they can live and Allah Azza wa Jal has guided them to what they need 
by necessity and, and the things that they need in order to be able to survive. As Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Taha, ayah number 50, الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى The one who has given everything its creation and then guided it. And he guided it to what it needs in order to be able to live. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected those different types of creation with his hifth by protecting and shielding them from all of the negative and harmful and evil things that are around them. There are so many uh, negative things, so many evil things, so many harmful things around us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us from. And you know, just on this topic, I and mean, when you think about it, how Allah has given the human body the ability to remove toxins. I and mean, subhanAllah, you see people put, we put, so we all, I mean, even if we, I mean, as Muslims, we have a pretty clean diet, you know, no alcohol, you know, none of these evil meats and evil foods. And yet still we put so many toxins in our, you know, in our uh, bodies. Whether it is, you know, even if we avoid, you know, the, the alcohol and smoking and whatever, but still we put so many toxins, you know, all these uh, drinks that we drink and these food that we eat and fast food and all this horrible stuff that is just full of toxins we put in our body. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected us by yani, for giving the body an amazing ability to remove toxins. And it's not until you literally, you know, fill yourself with the stuff every single day that it starts to... You know that it starts to harm you. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given your body an ability, an amazing ability to remove toxins. You know, just the body's ability to remove, you know, things like uh, cells that have become precancerous and that have become like, that are harmful to the body. And the body's ability that Allah azza wa has given it to be able to remove all of those poisons and toxins and the cells that will harm you and all of that. And it's, an, it's absolutely amazing. It's an ayah from the ayat of Allah azza wa jal. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the ability to be protected from the toxins and the harms and the viruses and the, all the whatever the bacteria and stuff that is around us that is causing us harm. And in this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has encompassed the good people and the bad people. You know, Allah has given us all a body that has that ability. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not distinguished between the mu'min and the kafir. That he has given the mu'min the body that can remove the toxins and the kafir the body that cannot. No, he has given all of you the same in this regard, this general guidance. Likewise, Allah has not distinguished between the human being and between the animal or the insect. Allah has given them their ability to remove the harm from themselves and so on and so forth by you know, his permission. And Allah Azza wa Jal has decreed and has given the responsibility to a group of angels which their job is to protect us by the permission of Allah. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, لَهُمْ مُعَقِّبَاتٌ مِّن بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ يَحْفَظُونَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ In Surah Al-Ra'id, Ayah number 11. He has مُعَقِّبَات يعني protecting angels in front of him and behind him and every human being has protective angels in front of you and behind you that protect you by the permission of Allah from whatever would harm you. And there are angels who are given the job to protect you from harms that would otherwise come to you in order that the command of Allah and the qadr of Allah be fulfilled. Meaning that they protect and defend you by the permission of Allah from whatever would harm you. And they repel the harms that uh, would otherwise reach you. And this is with the hifth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the protection of Allah azza wa jal. So that is the general, that's a general protection. But then there is a specific kind of protection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. And that is, in addition to what we have previously mentioned, the protection that Allah azza wa jal gives to his beloved servants, 
by protecting their iman. بحفظ إيمانهم من الشبه المضلة. By protecting their iman from these doubts that would creep into it and cause this person to be misguided. Or from al fitan, from the trials and tribulations. And from al shahawat al muhlika, from the desires that would destroy a person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken your heart. As a believer, inshallah, Allah has taken your heart. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected that heart from doubts that would cause it to be misguided. One of the things that I deal with, I think pretty much any, nearly every week, if not every week, are Muslims who have turned to atheism. People who have left the religion of Islam or are seriously considering leaving the religion of Islam. And it's becoming extremely frequent. But it just shows you how much you need the hifth of Allah. If Allah doesn't protect your heart from these shubahat, they will go into your heart the same way that they went into those people's hearts. And those people went, and he, they didn't go from Islam to Christianity, or Islam to Judaism, or Islam to, you know, some sort of other religious belief. And they went from Islam to saying that there is no creator, there is no God. And everything that happens in the universe is random. And they went from this to that. From this to that. If we don't have the protection of Allah Azza wa Jal, there is no reason why we could not also fall into that. Because the only reason you haven't fallen into that is because Allah Azza wa Jal has protected your heart from those shubahat. So when these atheists talk and they give you one of their doubts, you turn around and you say, that's ridiculous. The reason you think it's ridiculous and the reason you feel safe is because Allah Azza wa Jal has protected your heart. He's put a barrier over it that doesn't, a shield that doesn't let that doubt reach into your heart. But if Allah Azza wa Jal removes that shield, that doubt will reach into your heart. And there are people, there are talabu to ilm, yani people, students of knowledge, yani people of, of, who have written books about Islam, who have studied extensively from scholars who left Islam at the end of their life. People from the students of some of the major scholars of our time who left Islam. And the last part of their life, they, li they lived and they died as an atheist. Can you imagine that? Nobody is safe. You can't say, oh, I teach, I teach, I study, I'm a student, I memorize. Only by the hifth of Allah Azza wa Jal is your heart safe. And Allah Azza wa Jal saves you from al-fitan, trials and tribulations. Because there are trials and tribulations that shake a person's iman. Didn't the Prophet Sallallahu tell us about the end of time? That there will come a time when a person will wake up as a believer and go to sleep as a disbeliever and will go to sleep as a disbeliever will go to sleep as a believer and wake up as a disbeliever. There will come a time when holding on to your religion is like holding on to hot coals. And all of these ahadith about the fitr, there will come trials like qita'il layl al like pieces of the dark night when one of them comes, the person, the believer will say, this is my destruction. And when he's saved from it, the another one will come that is worse than that. And he will say, rather, this is my destruction. All of these ahadith about the fitan and the trials, the dajjal and all of these things that we're talking about in the Friday night reflections, Allah Azza wa Jal has protected you by his hif from experiencing these things. And from a shahawat al muhlika from the desires which destroy a person. And you know, back when I was talking about atheism, I, I really, you know, something that I mean, benefits on this point. Yeah. I don't believe that anyone reaches that level of turning their back on Islam because of an intellectual argument, because of a shubha, an intellectual <coughs> doubt that they had. Rather, most of them reach that level, first of all, emotionally, and then they find shubuhat which support their decision. Yani they, they, first of all, they hold a belief, and then they go looking for some evidence which will support their belief. I don't believe you get a Muslim who opens a book of Darwinian's, you know, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, 
and he reads it and he says, I don't want to believe in Allah anymore. Rather, there is an emotional reason why he doesn't believe in Allah. Like he'll say, I made dua and Allah didn't answer me, or you know, this happened to me, or my parent, a Muslim, didn't treat me well. And then he will go looking for something and he will find origin of the species or some other similar book and he will use that to justify his kufr but the origin of his kufr is not shubuhat the origin of his kufr is shahawat it's just his desires he, wa he doesn't want to have to follow the halal and the haram he doesn't want to have to stick to these rules he is angry with Allah that Allah didn't answer his dua or he is frustrated with the way some Muslims dealt with him there's an emotional shahwa based reason, desire based reason why this individual turned away from Islam. And then they went looking for shubahat which served them to prove a justification. And the more I deal with people like this, the more I realize that wallahi, and I, and I had a discussion with a very beloved brother about this topic, and, and I really genuinely believe this is the case. That often it's not the shubahat that misguide a person initially the first thing that the person falls into is shahawat, shahawat desires and those desires lead them to intellectual confusion and confusing arguments and confusing proofs and they get themselves mixed up but in the first instance it wasn't those arguments that that came down in other words it's almost like you're saying that the hifd of allah was removed from them when they followed their desires. And when they started following their desires, Allah took away his hip and all of these doubts and confusions were able to penetrate their heart. Why did they not penetrate them before? Because the person was from those people, he prevented his soul from what it wanted. He prevented its soul from its desires. But when the person started to allow his soul to follow its desires, Allah Azza wa Jal took away that hif and the person's heart became open to all of these doubts and this confusion and that is how they ended up, where they ended up. So from the hif of Allah Azza wa Jal is that he protects us from these things فَيُعَافِيهِمْ مِنْهَا and Allah Azza wa Jal gives us al afiyah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us safe and sound and healthy and secure from these trials and these doubts and these desires. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects them, his believers, from their enemies among the jinn and the ins. And uh, perhaps we can, we can you know, stop, or uh, the Sheikh is going to mention, I'll mention it when the Sheikh mentions it. Uh, I was going to bring a, a hadith, but the Sheikh mentions the hadith. Thing. So inshallah, come to it. But Allah Azza wa Jal protects you from your enemies, from the jinn and the men. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns them away from you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repels their plots and plans that they make against you as Allah Azza wa Jal said inna Allah yudafi'u 'anil ladina amanu surah al-hajj ayah number 38 indeed Allah defends those who believe Allah Azza wa Jal defends those who believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defends you against your enemies their plots and their plans and this is important also, and I know I keep going off on it. Today is a day of going off on tangents, but la bas inshallah. Important also when people, some people get very upset and very focused upon the conspiracies and the plots of the enemies of Islam. And I don't doubt, I don't think any Muslim who reads the Quran, the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has any doubt that the enemies of Islam are plotting against Islam. But some people become obsessed by this. And they become, you know, it, it makes them lose sleep at night over what the enemies of Islam are plotting and what they are planning and what they're going to do next and how they're going to, you know, how they're going to enter into the, to, to Islam and the Muslims. But in reality, what we should be more focused on is protecting ourselves in relation to Allah and, the, and preserving, our, preserving our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah is the one that repels these plots. Allah azza wa is the one that makes the plots of the enemies of Islam against them. They, they are awake all night planning to destroy Islam 
and Allah Azza wa Jal takes their plot and turns it completely against them. There is a you know interesting you know just example of this to give a non-controversial example. There were a group of Orientalists who made a plot, and their plot was to turn the Muslims away from the Quran. And the way they decided to do this was they decided they were going to make a, basically an encyclopedia or an index, a topic index stroke encyclopedia of the Quran. And what this would basically do is it would stop the Muslims from reading the Quran so much to find you know, like their topics and their bits of information because they can, the index will take them straight to the eye. They will not need to, like they will not spend so long reading the Quran. This is the, the idea behind it. What did that do for the Muslims? Are the Muslims going to stop reading the Quran? Of course not. They took it, they said, Jazakallah khair. That's a really nice topic index. We'll benefit from that. And they benefited from it. They learned it. They keep it in their library. They use it for, yeah, to help them to find topics in the Quran. And they still read the same amount of Quran that they used to read before. Look at how they made a plan and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a plan. They're making a plan day and night to take the Muslims away from the Quran. And Allah Azza wa Jal simply made it a service to the Muslims and a benefit for and a benefit for the Muslims. And this is the way that Allah Azza wa Jal deals with the enemies of Islam. They spend day and night planning to destroy Islam, and everything they plan only serves to make Islam stronger as long as we have a good relationship with Allah, as long as our connection to Allah is good. But when we turn away from Allah, one of the punishments that Allah puts upon us is the plots of the enemies of Islam start to work. They start to work and they start to have an effect. Whereas before they did not work and they did not have an effect. But they start to work and they start to have an effect when uh, we turn or if we turn away from Islam. And the Shaykh he mentions a final point and he says, According to the strength of your Iman or the defense of Allah of you is according to the strength of your Iman. So the stronger your Iman is, the stronger Allah's defense of you is. And the better or the stronger Allah defends you and protects you, the stronger your Iman. And the stronger your Iman, the stronger it is that Allah Azawajal protects you. And that is why, and this is the hadith which came to mind, that the, in the hadith of Ibn Abbas anhuma, this wonderful, amazing hadith that you must teach your children. This hadith is an obligation to teach your children. Because this is a, a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Ghulam, inni u'allimuka kalimat. O oh, young boy, young child, I'm going to teach you something. Ihfadillaha <coughs> ihfad. And there's a long hadith, we're just going to take this part because it relates to our topic today. Ihfadillaha yahfadhik. Ihfadillaha yahfadhik. I'm going to talk about the literal meaning first, then we'll talk about like what this actually means. Do hifd of Allah, and Allah will do hifd of you. And why am I not saying protect? Because there isn't a good English word. I, there's not a good... The word is too, heft is too comprehensive to bring an English word and say, uh, you know this, but I would say the closest thing I could bring in English, God, your relationship with Allah, or God, the rights of Allah, and Allah will guard you. Ihfadillaha yahfadik. Do heft of Allah, and Allah will do heft of you. How do you do heft of Allah? By heft of your worship of Him, by heft of your, by protecting and preserving your worship of Him, by protecting your preserving what Allah has commanded you to do, what Allah has told you not to do, by all of those things that you have been commanded to do, and by building that strong connection and relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal, that you did heft of Allah, and Allah does heft of you. And you preserved your relationship and your connection and your and the rights of Allah, and Allah Azza wa Jal preserves you and protects you. And it's narrated by Ahmed and a Tirmidhi, meaning Ihfaz awamirahu bil imtithal wa nawahihi 
ونواهي باجتناب وحدوده وحدوده بعدم تعديها meaning God the commands of Allah by doing them and do hifth of the prohibitions of Allah by keeping away from them and do hifth of the limits of Allah by not going over them and this is a practical we always talk about what does it mean Allah is al-hafiz how do we implement it it's one of the ways you can implement it the one of the ways you can implement this name or these two names by doing hifth of the commands of Allah by doing them and hifth of the prohibitions of Allah by keeping away from them and hifth of the limits of Allah by not going over them and Allah Azza wa Jal will protect you and your religion and your wealth and your children from every single thing and all of us talk about how do I protect my children? How do I protect my children from Ayn? How do I protect myself from the jinn and the shayateen? How do I protect my work from the evil eye? How do I protect my business, my wealth? How do I protect my family? This is the, one of the greatest ways to protect yourself. You protect what is between you and Allah, and Allah will protect you. And Allah Azza wa Jal has praised those servants who protect the rights of Allah, who guard the rights of Allah and the limits of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالْحَافِذُونَ لِحُدُودِ اللَّهِ وَبَشِّرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ In Surah At-Tawbah, ayah number 102, those who guard the limits of Allah, they do hifd of the limits of Allah. How do you do hifth of the limits of Allah? You don't go over them. You don't go past them. They do hifth of the limits of Allah. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, هَذَا مَا تُوْعَدُونَ لِكُلِّ أَوَّابٍ حَفِيظٍ مَنْ خَشِيَ الرَّحْمَانَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَجَاءَ بِقَلْبٍ مُنِيبٍ This is what is promised to everyone who returns to Allah and everyone who does hifth. Hifth of the Qur'an? No. Hifth of what? Allah explains what the hifth means, the, the hafidh. Allah explains what it means, his servants who do hifth, those who fear the most merciful. Bil ghaib. And in, uh, and in absence. And they come with a heart that is munib, that is turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repenting to Allah azza wa jal. And from this is Hif at tawheed One of the greatest ways that you can be hafiz, you can be protecting the, the, that relationship and that connection with Allah Azza wa Jal is Hif at tawheed To protect your tawheed from anything that would either decrease it or nullify it. Because there are things that nullify your tawheed, your worship of Allah alone. What nullifies your worship of Allah alone is a shirk, making a partner with Allah Azza wa Jal. How do we know it nullifies it? وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَابَلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَكَ We have revealed to you and those who came before you that if you make a partner with Allah, all of your deeds will be invalid. إِنَّهُ مَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever makes a partner with Allah, Jannah is haram for him. So there are things which nullify your tawheed. They nullify your worship of Allah Azza wa alone. They completely wipe it out. And there are things which decrease from it. Like having this attachment to people, you know. Having this attachment to, to getting people to do things for you. And, you know, asking people for things all the time. Look at the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ spoke about the 70,000 who will enter Jannah bi ghayri hisab wa la adab. And he said, Humul ladina la yastarqoon, wa la yatatayyaroon, wa la yaktuun, wa ala rabbihim yatawakkaloon. They are those people who do not seek ruqya, and they do not cauterize, and they do not believe in, and they do not believe in omens, and they do not cauterize, and upon their Lord they trust. These things are not from 
Nawaqid al-Tawheed. They don't remove your Tawheed. They are not shirk. They are from Nawaqis al-Tawheed. They reduce the, your Tawheed. They reduce the, the, the level of your, of your connection to Allah and your worshipping Him alone. That you go begging people, please help me. If you don't read something for me, I will not be able to be cured. Yani, this feeling, it's like it decreases from your Tawheed. And there is nothing wrong with seeking Ruqya for the one who has a need. And the one who maybe can't pray, if he doesn't do that, that is wajib upon him. But as for the people going around desperate for somebody to help them, this decreases your Tawheed. It doesn't invalidate your Tawheed, doesn't wipe it out, it just lowers it down. But from the hifth that Allah has commanded you to do, is the hifth that is protecting your worship of Allah alone from anything that would nullify it or anything that would decrease from it. And this is the greatest thing that you must preserve. And in the hadith of Ibn Abbas, this is the greatest hif that you are commanded to do. Because this is hif asl al-iman. You are preserving the, the core of your iman. The thing from which your iman grows and, and, and spreads and, and flowers. From that one thing, from that belief that Allah alone deserves to be worshipped. So it is the greatest thing that you must protect. And also from the hif that you are commanded to do is hif sha'air al-islam to guard and to protect the, the 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 symbols or the or the rituals of Islam. The sha'air, those things which Islam is known by, like the salah and the adhan. And you know the, these uh, the Hajj and these you know these kind of things that are sha'ir, they are symbols, they are rituals that Islam is known by. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, "Hafidu ala salawati wa salati wusta wa kumul illahi qanit." God make hifz of the prayers, and especially the middle prayer. Aisha said, Salat al-Asr, the Asr prayer. And stand before Allah in silence or in obedience. And from the things that Allah Azza wa Jal has commanded you to make hif of, is hif al-sam' wal-basar wal-fu'ad, is to guard your ears and to guard your eyes and to guard your heart. To guard your ears from listening to things that Allah hates. And to guard your eyes from looking at things that Allah hates. And to guard your heart from things that would enter it or actions that it does. Because remember your heart is both a receptacle for, for knowledge and information. And it's also an, uh, something that does actions, fear and hope and love. To guard your heart from anything that would make it sick. You guard your ears from anything that would displease Allah and you guard your eyes from anything that would displease Allah and you guard your heart from anything that would make it sick. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, In Surah Al-Isra, ayah number 36. Indeed, the hearing and the sight and the heart, all of those things he will be asked about. And from the things that you have been commanded to guard and to take care of is hifth al-furuj, to guard your chastity, your private parts. As Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ أَوْ مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ غَيْرُ مَلُومِينَ فَمَنْ إِبْتَغَى وَرَاءَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْعَادُونَ In Surah Al-Mu'minun, ayah number five and number seven. Those who are guardians who protect their private parts except for their wives and those whom their right hands possess for these they are not blameworthy and whoever wants something beyond that it is they who are the transgressors and there are many many other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised or has commanded us to protect and promised us that he will protect us if we protect those things and if we protect our tongues and we protect our ears and our eyes and we protect our hearts and we protect 
our private parts from doing something which would make Allah Azza wa Jal angry, then Allah Azza wa Jal will protect us. And there is no doubt that there is no one who can protect us from in our religion and in our dunya from anything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَاللَّهُ خَيْرٌ حَافِظًا وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمٍ Surah Yusuf, ayah number 64. Allah is the best protector. And He is the most merciful of those who show mercy. And there's no doubt that one of the ways that we implement this name, in addition to what we've said, is that we, we make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal to protect us. And we make dua to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala to give us al-afiyah. And I wanted to highlight a point uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade making dua for sabr before a calamity affects you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade you from making dua for sabr before a calamity affects you. Why? When you ask Allah, Oh Allah, make me sabr. What are you saying? Sabr, in this case, you are saying, Oh Allah, give me an affliction and then make me patient. Rather, you are commanded to ask Allah for al-afiyah, for Allah to keep you safe from being afflicted in the first place. But if you are afflicted with something, at that time you can ask Allah for sabr. Like if you become sick, or if you become in a, you know, in a difficult situation, or, or you, you are struggling with poverty or the loss of life, you can ask Allah for patience. But you can't ask Allah for patience before you've been tested by something. Rather, you must ask Allah for al-afiyah. And from the things which Allah, which Allah commanded us to say, when we go, when the evening comes, and when the afternoon comes, Salatul Asr, and when the morning comes after Fajr, Allahumma inni as'aluk al-afiyata fi dunya wal akhirah. Allahumma inni as'aluk al-afwa wal afiyah fi dini wa dunya wa ahli wa mali. Allahumma astur awrati wa amin rawati. Allahumma ahfadni min bayni yadayya wa min khalfi wa an yameeni wa an shimali wa min fawqi wa a'udhu bi azamatika an ughtala min tahti. And the meaning of this dua, O oh Allah, I ask you for al-afiyah in the dunya and in the akhirah. Yani I ask you to keep me safe from trials and safe from sicknesses and safe from problems in this world and the next. O oh Allah, I ask you for al-afu wal-afiyah, for you to overlook my mistakes and for you to give me safety and, and health and, and uh, to keep me safe in my religion and in my worldly life and in my family and my wealth. O oh Allah, conceal my flaws and remove my fears. O oh Allah, protect me from in front of me and behind me and from my right and from my left and from above. And I seek refuge with your greatness from being dragged from below. This is a beautiful dua that we say after Salat al-Asr and after Salat al-Fajr uh, from the Adhkar sabah wal masa and something that we can also implement as the meaning of al-Hafid and al-Hafid. I have one, only one small point left which we usually talk about. Sometimes uh, the Sheikh doesn't distinguish between the two names because they both come from al-Hif. But there is no doubt just for, for because I think it's, it's pretty obvious to an Arabic speaker, but maybe to a non-Arabic speaker we should explain. The difference between Hafidh and Hafidh is that Hafidh is more emphatic than Hafidh. Hafidh means uh, maybe protector or preserver. And Hafidh is the same meaning, but more emphasis, more, more power to it, more uh, like indicating continuity. The one who continuously protects or continuously preserves. Perhaps that is how we would, you know, distinguish the protector, the preserver, the one who continuously protects and continuously preserves. 
Now, I took a longer than I normally uh, take on this one, and I think because I went off on so many tangents on that, but uh, inshallah ta'ala, we will be back next Friday, Friday Night Reflections. The topic will be the major signs of the Day of Judgment. We'll be starting with the Dajjal, because what we said, we're going to do two lectures on the major signs of the Day of Judgment. The first one will be exclusively on the Dajjal. And the, all the other nine signs will be in the other one. Why did I decide to do it like this? Because the Dajjal is the first of the major signs of the Day of Judgment. So this is the one we should know the most. Because this is the one that will affect us before any of the others. So we'll talk about the Dajjal. And we're in including the Dajjal will be the descending of Isa ibn Maryam and Ya'juj and Ma'juj. We will cover this within. The, the first one, and then the remaining signs we will cover the next Friday night reflections, bi idnillahi ta'ala. Uh, as always, we don't take questions from you guys right now because many of you want to go and it's, a, and it's a Friday, you have things to do. And those who want to stay are welcome to stay and ask uh, questions, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum, Allahu a'lam. Wa salatu wa salam, ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.